Without further ado, allow me to introduce our featured guest, Lorna Landvik, is best known to many as the pen behind many of the comedic staples of the Minnesota literary canon. Those include Hattie Jane's House of Curl, Angry Housewives Eating Bonbons, and Best to Laugh. As already noticed, her latest is Chronicles of a Radical Hag with Recipes. Each of our Stand Up for Stand Up Friend honorees and Abby Norley speakers today will receive a signed copy of Chronicles, among other goodies from Mel. If you'd like your own copy of Lorna's latest, see the chat section for a purchase link from our partnering bookseller. Lorna is also a vocal advocate for Minnesota's libraries and has personally visited too many to count. Lorna, welcome and take it away. Thank you so much. Look what I have. Adele's new album. I believe it's really zooming up the Billboard hot chart. I am so happy to be here today celebrating with you, celebrating um, the Minnesota Friends of the Library, uh, Mel, celebrating books, celebrating readers, celebrating writers. Do um, you know what Lady Bird Johnson said about libraries? She said, Perhaps no place in the community is so totally democratic as the town library. The only entrance requirement is interest. It's been so fun for me in thinking about today to look into my memory bank and remember all the libraries I visited as a kid, in my youth, um, in my not so youth. Um, as I sang, I did dry, ride my banana bike to the Longfellow Library, which was a replica of um, Henry Wadsworth Longfellow's uh, New England house. It was situated on the banks of Minnehaha Creek. I would ride there, I would enter the front door, a librarian was seated right there behind a staircase that was always roped off. I don't know what happened upstairs, but to the children's library, you would go left to the adults library, you would go right. And there I would check out my books, put them in the basket of my banana bike, pedal across the road to the Minnehaha Falls Pavilion where I would buy a huge brick of taffy wrapped in wax paper. I think it cost a quarter. I would ride back across the road down the grassy hill to the statue of Longfellow that's still there. And I would sit at the base of that statue with my books and my taffy. And I wasn't aware of the word Nirvana yet, but I was there. Um, and I just hope that I was careful with the taffy's stickiness. Um, and my other library as a kid was the Nokomis Library. And that was built after they closed the Longfellow Library. And we were so excited on its grand opening. 
we pedaled our banana bikes. We all had those at that, you know, the high handlebars um, road down there. And years later, one of the people who had attended that event with me gave me an old, old newspaper clipping of the grand opening that was in the paper. And we had our pictures taken. We were hanging out in the teenager's loft, even though we weren't quite teenagers, you know, acting cool. Um, that library has been so important to me, not just as a reader, but as a writer. Um, also bookmobiles. Oh, now there's a magic bus, the bookmobiles. When they would come, I was just so thrilled to, you know, clomp up those metal steps and I love the smell. And, you know, the one of the fun things about a library is finding books you never knew you were looking for. And, you know, we do tend to judge books by their covers. And for some reason, this book called Failsafe had caught my nine-year-old interest and I wanted to check it out, but the librarian kindly um, dissuaded me. You know, she, she probably knew a book about nuclear war um, and espionage was not um, appropriate for, you know, a fourth grader. So instead, you know, I went to the, the stacks where Caddy Woodlawn and Little House on the Prairie and Betsy Tacey and Tib and Ginny and Geneva were. Um, I think of the libraries that I visited when I've been on book tours and every time I have, uh, you know, spare minutes, I'll go visit the town libraries. Um, I think of the library that I visited when I lived in San Francisco and it was the North Beach branch. And it, you know, the beat era was over, but it definitely had a beat poet vibe to it. I think it was almost mandatory that you had to wear a beret when you went in there. Um, when I lived in Hollywood, I would roller skate down the Walk of Fame on Hollywood Boulevard and take a right on Ivar Avenue where the old Carnegie Library was. And because that was in the middle of Hollywood, you definitely had your Hollywood patrons. Um, I'll never forget, I was in the biography section and this woman approached me and she, you know, had so much makeup on, you know, and it was like August, it was nowhere near Halloween and her hair was like a pink white swirl on top of her head. And she just gave me a real dirty look and, and I, I was taking out a, you know, biography of Errol Flynn and she said, he was my lover. <laughs> That's who you'd meet on Hollywood Boulevard. Um, my family and I years ago took a trip to Norway and for a couple of days we were on the Hurtigruten, which is uh, not really a cruise ship. It, it's like a working ship that stops in ports and delivers mail and um, supplies. And they had a lending library on that ship, which I would browse through and select things. and. I found my book, Angry Housewives Eating Bonbons there. And it was thrilling because I just, I pictured, you know, the grizzled old captain sitting on the bridge of the ship, you know, as the Northern Lights danced behind him, you know, oh, oh yeah, those angry housewives, <laughs> they're crazy. Um, so I've always just loved libraries. They are sanctuaries to me. Um, when I was in first grade, I learned how to read and I learned how to read with the Dick and Jane books. See Puff Run, See Spot Run. And it was then and there that I determined to be a writer because I one day wanted to write compelling prose like that. So my course was set, but I had also always liked to act. So in my twenties, I did live in Hollywood um, seeking not just a movie career, I was actually uh, gunning for Meryl Streep's career, but she didn't want to give it up. Um, so I would write fiction, but short fiction, I would write monologues that I would perform in my stand-up comedy routines. I would write monologues for my friends, but I never felt I had the gravitas yet to 
write that which I had always wanted to write novels. Um, to survive out there while I was, you know, being on stage and visiting agents, um, I would waitress or I would use the typing skills that I learned in Mr. Welbis's ninth grade typing class and I would temp. And to temp in LA is really fun. You get sent to places like the 1984 Winter Olympics, um, where I typed in the teleprompter room live as the scores came in for the sportscasters to announce. So I did have a lot of power. You know, I could have changed scores now and then, but I, I kept to the script. I also temped at movie companies, record companies. Um, and once my temp agent called me up and she said, uh, yeah, uh, we're sending you to the Playboy Mansion. And I said, no, you're not. <laughs> you know, I'm a feminist. I'm not going to go to the Playboy Mansion. And she assured me it was strictly clerical. Um, so I decided, like Mar Margaret Mead, to explore a secret culture. And it was the only job my husband ever begged to drive me to. But again, all I did was type. I typed labels for hundreds of, of video cassettes. I typed synopses. Um, I got a fun job of watching old classic movies and then writing synopses. Um, so I was writing, I was acting, I was visiting my local library. Um, and then we had our, our older daughter. And her birth really changed physically, metaphorically, all those leaves, um, our lives in that I had a dream at when she was like three weeks old, that I was Gorbachev's temp secretary. And he had just come into power and nobody knew what the relationship between the superpowers were. And in my dream, a nuclear weapon had been set. You know, may, when I think of it, maybe that book fail safe imprinted on my brain somehow. Um, but anyway, I woke up and I was so shook and I stood over my little baby's crib thinking, what kind of world have we brought you into? And so that dream really began what turned out to be millions of steps. We joined um, a group of a thousand people um, on the great peace march for global nuclear disarmament. And we walked from LA to Washington, DC. It took us nine months. We lived in tents. We had a movable city with a school bus, a daycare bus, a mail truck, um, food trucks, equipment trucks. And we also had a little lending library along with, because even when we were marching anywhere from 11 to 25 miles a day, we knew that you know we would have to find our solace, our who taking a breath by reading, you know, by tent light. Um, when we moved, when we got back to Hollywood, um, I decided Meryl was, you know, wow, she's doing a great job with our career. And we decided to move back to Minneapolis. Um, and very conveniently, as we were packing up our old Chevy, these two women came into my head and their names were Patty Jane and Harriet. And I thought, who are you? And they were very polite. They brought a title, Patty Jane's House of Curl. And I thought, huh, well, whatever this is, I think it has something to do with the beauty salon, which was really out of my league because my mother never went to a beauty salon. She was very proud of her naturally wavy hair. Never gave me as a kid that which I coveted, you know, a Tony perm. But I thought, well, these characters, they know something I don't. Although I also thought for a minute, maybe, maybe I'm supposed to write about, you know, a house of curl, a place where you play kind of an odd winter sport. <laughs> um, so I started writing. I spent Monday and Thursday nights at the Nokomis Library. They were open until nine o'clock then. And my family understood those were my office hours. And I would diligently write to the sound of that, you know, tinkling waterfall. And I wrote all by hand. Um, it's really funny. I, 
found the log because I kept track of how many words I wrote a day. And coming across that, I saw, whoa, one day I wrote 20 pages. I couldn't believe it. And then I realized, yeah, I was probably using some awfully big handwriting at that time. Um, I gradually did transfer to a used computer. It was a triangle that had a, I mean, a rectangle that had a screen the size of a, a postage, you know, a postcard, um, ultimately graduated to a desktop and then to a laptop, which I love because I really do love to recline when I write. Um, you can't really recline in libraries, but they offer so much more um, to write in. You know, I would look around and see all these books and think, well, they did it. Maybe I can do it. And, you know, to me, library people say now oh well we've got the whole world on our computers on our phones but you don't have a physical place without ads you know sure you can be on a, your computer at the library but you can also turn it off turn off that distraction of instant messages of email beeps and just absorb all that wisdom that's there and it it sounds Woo -hoo. But I really do believe that so much is stored in those books as you sit there and just through osmosis, um, you learn something. And I, that sounds kind of nutty, but I do believe Mr. Mark Twain said something similar. Do you know what Germaine Greer said about libraries? She said, a library is a place where you can lose your innocence without losing your virginity. Um, I really do think that libraries, they're like a civic gift, you know, an honor. They're honoring its citizens. Here's a place for you to sit with your thoughts, your dreams, to study, to create, to learn about things, to worry, to, to do everything in. Um, COVID was a very odd time and how's that for an understatement? Um, you probably saw my picture earlier. I entered COVID a blonde. I left uh, with white hair. Um, I was really daunted with my writing when our state hit its lockdown. I just, I, I didn't know what was ahead. I mourned that which was what, which was behind. Was that grammatically correct? I mourned that which was what behind, was behind. Well, you get my drift. Um, and I just, I couldn't write, but I could read. And that was such a solace. And the first big tome I read during COVID was Chesapeake by James Michener. And that's, you know, that's a big book. And in bed, I would open its pages and just get immersed in a different time in the history of Chesapeake Bay, of uh, you know its native population, the pirates that pillaged it, its indigenous foods and and plants, and you know I learned all about crabs, you know the kind that you eat, and it just took me away as books will do from my problems of the day. I think that I write as a reader. Um, I want to write something that makes me want to turn the page, that makes me want to know more about the characters, that makes me want to laugh or cry. Um, and I'm so thrilled that I'm published. It's, it's such an honor. Um, and my hope is that readers will feel the same or similar things to me when I write the books or you know reading is subjective they can they can think whatever they want um, but for me it's just a privilege to be a writer and it's a privilege to be a reader um, I did an event it was one of my very first events in Houston Texas and I was on a panel with very esteemed writers and they were giving beautiful speeches and I thought oh boy maybe I should have written a speech because I had just decided to tell a story improvising audience suggestions so I got on stage 
I think I followed Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. And I said, oh, yeah, I was at the library the other day and I, I uh, had my backpack and I was surprised to find inside it and a guy yells out, a big yellow banana. So I had to create a story around that big yellow banana. And later that man approached me and he introduced himself and his wife. And it turns out his story was so thrilling. He had had polio as a boy and was in an iron lung skipped a grade, never learned how to read, yet managed to go all the way through high school. He employed over 500 people. He was a big business owner, faking reading. And it wasn't until their children were born that his wife noticed, you know, anytime the, the, a child clamored on his lap, daddy, daddy, read to me, he, he didn't know how to read. So she taught him. And he was forever indebted to her. And he, she told me, oh, I, you know, we couldn't, I was afraid to drive with him because he, he'd, he'd read everything. He'd yell out, stop. And I'd, you know, I'd slam on the brakes. And um, that gift came to this gentleman years later, but it was a gift that he inhaled. And I think he must have read, he told me like 500 books in two years. Um, so that was thrilling. Um, do you know what Shakespeare says about uh, writing in the Tempest? Me, poor man, my library was dukedom large enough. Um, so what can I say more about libraries other than what Isaac Asimov has said? He says, it isn't just a library. It's a spaceship that will take you to the farthest reaches of the universe, a time machine that will take you to the far past and the far future, a teacher that knows more than any human being, a friend that will always amuse you and console you, and most of all, a gateway to a better, happier, and more useful life. And I say amen to that. And I also have a poem about libraries. It's a little wild, so fasten your seatbelt. It's called If Librarians Were Honest, and it's by Joseph Mills. If librarians were honest, they wouldn't smile or act welcoming. They would say, you need to be careful. Here be monsters. They would say, these rooms house heathens and heretics, murderers and maniacs, the deluded the desperate and dissolute. They would say, these books contain knowledge of death, desire, and decay, betrayal, blood, and more blood. Each is a Pandora's box. So why would you want to open one? They would post danger signs warning that, they would post danger signs warning that contact might result in mood swings, severe changes in vision, and mind altering effects. If librarians were honest, they would admit the stacks can be more seductive and shocking than porn. After all, once you've seen a few breasts, vaginas, and penises, more is simply more a comforting uh, banality. But the shelves of a library contain sensational novelties, a scandalous permissive mingling of Malcolm X, Marx, Melville, Merwin, Millay, Milton, Morrison and anyone can check them out, taking them home or to some corner where they can be debauched and impregnated with ideas. If librarians were honest, they would say, no one spends time here without being changed. Maybe you should go home while you still can. So let's just have one more round of Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much. 
And now I am happy to talk to you and chat with you. Hey, Ann. I can't hear you. Cute. You know, after 18 months of Zoom, you would think we could remember to click two buttons. <laughs> I'll, I'll blame you for being discombobulated. I was laughing so hard <laughs> that I had to like, um, wasn't quite together there. So thank you. Thank you. You gave me just what I needed on a, on a Saturday morning. How did you land on the ukulele? Well, you know, when I was a kid, um, I came from a musical family on my mother's side, at least. Um, and she and her uh, seven sisters and one brother all played piano. And I didn't want to play the piano. So I played the flute. Um, but you can't sing when you play the flute. So um, when my older daughter, we got her piano. Actually, my mother gave her her piano. And so I started teaching myself with her beginner books. Um, bye, 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 clink, clink. And, and then I thought, well, I want something a little more portable. So the ukulele is just fun and it's easy. It's only got four strings. And I'm sure you were very, very impressed with um, my capabilities. <laughs> um, <laughs> Um, as, a, as a librarian, I'll take any song written honoring libraries and loving libraries. So thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> um, we have a few questions that were submitted ahead of time. And I'll remind everyone that um, if you have questions that came about from uh, the comments that Lorna shared with us, feel free. At the bottom of your screen, you'll find a toolbar and you can click on chat and send the questions directly to me, send them to David as our technical wizard behind the scenes, or even share your question with the whole group. And then I'll convey it to Lorna so that she can answer. So um, thank you for that. And I also would remind you to look at the chat because um, our chair of our program committee, Sue Grove, um, has put the link in so that you can certainly, while we love people going to libraries and checking out Lorna's book, we want authors to have book sales. So remember to think about buying her book as well. Personal um, libraries are good too. Yes. <laughs> What is your writing routine now that you, you know, you're an established writer? You talk about that first book and Monday and Thursday night being sacred to you for your family. What, what is your writing routine now? You know, I love to hear from other writers what their processes are and how they write. And I always admire those who are, you know, diligent about having their coffee maker set at 530 you know, automatically, so they'll wake up to the smell of brewing coffee, and they'll sit down and get to work. Um, but I have to ease into the morning, you know, I have to do the crossword puzzles, um, we'd get two papers, um, you know, they get harder as the week goes on, so I waste more time, uh, I have to take the dog to our beautiful Fort Snelling dog park, so it really isn't until the afternoon that I start saying, oh yeah, I should sit down. Or sometimes I choose the nights. I now don't write in libraries as much as I write at home, as I said, because I like to recline with my laptop and they don't look kindly upon me when I you know, lie down on the library carpet um, or lay down. I never got those two words straight. Um, so my goal is to write every day. I don't have a time that I start. I don't have a time that I finish. Um, sometimes it's a couple hours. Sometimes it's five hours. Sometimes it's 20 minutes. Um, and on the days that I don't write, which I try to keep few and far between, I just think that my walking is pretty contemplative. So when I, you know, I'm with the dog, I'm just thinking about characters or situations. Um, but I would love to be a little more disciplined, but that means cracking the whip a little bit harder. And ow, I don't like that. So. 
advice that you would give to would-be writers? I know that there's always some lurking around in these uh, library program rooms. I would recommend reading as much as possible, um, not so that it takes away time from your what you want to write, um, and be strict with yourself, not uh, strict and tender. You know, I think a lot of people stop because, oh, it's so bad. And if it's bad, you rewrite it. You know, it's not etched in stone. Um, so be tender with your mistakes and okay, this will be better. If you're stuck, go to someplace else. Um, and just a real inspiration for me was being in the library and just seeing all the books out there and knowing oh yeah they were written by people just like me they had you know head shoulders body they were just like me um so don't be daunted um if you like a particular style of book like a thriller um write that which you like uh, in fact when i was during covid i was reading a lot of thrillers which I'll read occasionally in in normal times, but I I just was attracted to ugh, that high paced um, escape, um, and it, sometimes it helps to have a log too to keep track of mm -hmm. what you write daily. And if it's just a paragraph one day, don't beat yourself up. Just oh well, okay, maybe things are processing in my mind and maybe I'll do an hour tomorrow. Um, but you can get a lot done in little teeny chunks. So you mentioned that, that you know, when COVID started, that you were reading a lot, but not writing. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we've all gone through this worldwide pandemic. And as we've been reading, we've found that there are people who have become more creative, people who have become less creative because this has just been such a personal as well as societal change. Um, what what did you do to then, because uh, I'm assuming that 18 months in you're writing again. Yeah. What how did you how did you morph from from needing to read but not write back into writing? I just felt like a part of me was missing by not writing. And I don't like, you know, I can stand for parts of me to be missing, you know, um, like the bossy parts or the who stole my candy parts, you know, but not the, the writing part that it just meant too much to me. And I just, I really had to, you know, shake myself and, you know, snap out of it. This is something that you love to do. You feel you have stories to tell. So get to it. And so I did. Yeah. So one of the questions that we got ahead of time was knowing that you're now a grandmother, congratulations. Thank you. Um, do you think it's changed your writing process? Has it changed your worldview that you now have this generational uh, um, aspect in your life? Well, that started out as a nice, light little question, and then you just delve deeper and deeper. <laughs> um, so I would say yes to all that. It's changed. Well, my worldview, because I have children too, has always been, oh, what's next for you? And, uh, you know, I'm a firm believer in evolution, but things seem to be regressing lately, and I really worry about that. Um, I want, you know, I've always been an activist. Um, if there's something I feel I should march for, I will be there. Um, and it's not just for the exercise, but um, it's thrilling that she, she's two and a half now and she loves books. And to take her to the Nokomis Library where I grew up, where my daughters grew up, um, is thrilling and she's a greedy reader too. You know, she'll book, take book after book after book. Um, and it's just, it's a thrill to read to her and you get to visit that wonder through mm. a small child's eyes. Except when they ask you over and over again, read it again, you know, the same book over and over. Oh, okay. Um, 
but it's 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 thrilling. Um, one of the questions that we got ahead of time was um, asking you to go back to the beginning. And I love the fact that you you mentioned um, uh, Patty Jane. Um, how how did can you tell us the story behind that publication, how it went from two names popping into your head to going from the, that that inspiration to a book that we all know and love? Yes. Um, as I said, the two women came to me with their full names and a title, and it has turned out in my career that 90% of the time, that's how a book starts for me, the, with the appearance of two or three of the main characters who almost inevitably and very politely bring the title. So I'm given some clue about what I'm writing. My second book was called um, Your Oasis on Flame Lake. And when that when these characters brought that title, I thought, what's an oasis on Flame Lake? And yet I knew in the writing that I will discover, oh, it's about a nightclub a guy opens in his basement. Um, so Patty Jane, I never outline everything. I didn't know what was going on in the book. Um, her husband abandons her right before she's about to deliver their child. And he's running around, running along the river road and he slips on some ice and crashes into a tree. And I didn't know what happened to him. So I just, I thought, I'll get back to you. Just stay here in the snowbank. I, I don't know what's going to happen. So I went on and in my writing, the more I write, the more I learn, the more I go back and change things or foreshadow things. Um, so I find that surprise of writing a, a real treat, like, wow, they did what? And I know that I'm in charge and I'm the boss, but it still feels as if the characters have minds of their own. And sometimes I'm just chasing after them, trying to corral them before they hurt themselves. Um, so when I finished Patty Jane at the Nokomis Library, I would use their reference desk all the time to pour over the annually published writer's market book. And that's a, an annually published book that tells you about publishers, agents, formats, query letters. So I wrote what I thought was a, a compelling query letter and mailed that to dozens and dozens of New York agents and got dozens and dozens. No, no, thank you. No, sorry. Uh -huh. And finally, an agent said yes. Um, and it took this particular agent uh, 29 submissions to publishers. And I would ask to see their rejection letters. And so she'd mail them to me. And often I thought they were acceptance letters because they were very positive, but they'd always end with, unfortunately, we, we don't know what to do with this. Whereas we think, how about publish it? And finally, a very small mom and pop press wanted it. Um, they didn't pay advances, but at this point I was just thrilled somebody wanted it. Um, but the pop of this mom and pop publishing company happened to be um, a former publisher of the Wall Street Journal. So he had many, many contacts and I think got the book a lot more publicity than it would have um, from a different, you know, uh, another small press. And so while all that was happening, I didn't want to be tied up in the fate of Patty Jane because uh, it took so long to sell it and then see it on the shelves that I wrote my second book. And so when I finish a book, I always want to move on to the next. And, and again, maybe it's because most of my characters are from Minnesota, but they're so polite and they'll come to me just as I need them. You know, they're, they're not like South Dakotans. No, I kid, I kid, I joke, oh, Wisconsin. No, I'm kidding. Um, so yeah, again, what I would recommend to, to writers out there is to persevere. Because I really do consider my perseverance um, so integral in my getting published. And, you know, I didn't pers persevere in acting. If somebody said no to me, you know, I'd, okay, thank you. Hi. 
but in writing, I thought this is too important. I'm not going to let somebody's no be my final answer. So you decide when to say no. That's my mm -hmm. motto. Well, oh, that is that is motto. that is momentous advice. Thank you. Um, so you answered one of the questions without even knowing it. Um, do you choose your own book titles? So yes. Um, but how about the, then the cover art, that which is hopefully face out in the bookstore or maybe even a library that catches the attention? Um, how are those, the book jackets sometimes are really zany. So how, how, how does the cover art, how does that package come together? And I don't know why they're zany because, of course, you know that I, a lot of people confuse me for Proust. You know, those are the <laughs> books I write. But um, I've loved my recent covers. I think they're so fun. And as I said, you know, people do judge books by their covers. So I, I'm often given a couple of the artist's renditions and then I, I get to choose my favorite. Um, and often it's also the favorite of the publisher. Um, my titles, you know, I've had, I've been able to keep all my titles. Um, they wanted me to change Angry Housewives Eating Bonbons to the whole wide world right there. And that's a sentiment that one of the characters has when she's outside with her kids playing. And, you know, as a young mother, you think, wow, this is the whole wide world right right there and and I thought yeah it's an apt sentiment but I don't want it for a book title so I really fought to have that and I heard from a lot of people who said well I picked up the book because of the title and then I've also heard from people who said I almost did not pick up the book because of the title and sometimes I think oh please men you know I know that that may not be an inviting title to you um like Patty Grant's House of Girl, yeah, we'll take that, or Angry Housewives, or even, you know, Chronicles of a Radical Hack with recipes. But men, I write about people. And I do have to tell you, uh, I did an event and the host told me that her husband read Chronicles of a Radical Hack with recipes. And he said it was the book that taught him the most about women he's ever read. I didn't, I didn't pay her to say that. I was thrilled. And I just, uh, you know, I, I love men. And, but I do think in comparison, women are a little more broad minded in their tastes, you know, we'll read Jack Reacher books, we'll, you know, F, we'll read Failsafe, finally read Failsafe. Um, but men sometimes seem to shy away from books with women as heroes. And I'm not saying the men on this Zoom webinar, because I know you're all enlightened men if you love libraries. Um, but that's what I think. What was your question? Um, oh, about titles and-, and I, Well, titles, but also the cover art. Yes, and the cover art. And nowadays, you know, they a lot of book covers they don't do original art anymore, they do clip art. And so there have been times, um, for instance, my book, Oh My Stars, uh, the Star Tribune did a story about book covers and there were five books with that same cover. A Crystal mm -hmm. Jalian book. Uh, and, and, you know, they altered mine a little with the color and by having a guitar on the, on the bottom. But um, I guess it's just, too expensive to always have original art, which I mourn because, you know, unfortunately I've had original art uh, for my past couple books and I just, it pleases me as a writer and as a reader. So with regards to your male readers, Johnny in chat has said that you've got plenty of male flat fans. So oh, good John on you. Jacobs, thank you. <laughs> and, the hour. and then uh, John on different John um, wants to have you describe your publishing journey in relationship to working with an editor. You know, I have had really good luck. Um, 
the hardest editing was with my first book because I didn't know how much to fight for and how much uh, to give up. And the particular editor, I don't know that she was that um, cognizant of Minnesota. Um, I mean, she, she wondered if you could get a taxi cab in Minneapolis on New Year's Eve. And, you know, I would say, well, you know, we have a fleet. And uh, so it got to some of her questions. I, it, you know, she was, a, she was a good editor, but as I said, she just wasn't that aware of, she, I think she thought everything west of the East River was, you know, Amish or something. But um, so sometimes I'd like mess with her. Um, and I remember the phone ringing once and I raced upstairs and I was all winded and it was this editor and I said oh I'm so sorry I was just out plowing the north 40 and you know dead silence um so your editor's idea is really the same as yours they want what they hope will be the best book as you do too um so in Patty Jane's House of Pearl I did have to excise a whole character, which was hard for me because I really like this character. Um, in other books, you know, I will get, I've gotten like two page letter with just suggestions and not demands, but what about this? What do you think about that? How about if? And so that allows me to ponder and, oh yeah, that would, you know, that scene really does need to be, you know, earlier in the book. Um, so I can't really say that I've had uh, a hard time at all. I mean, I have writer friends who literally cry um, over what their editors are being asked to do. Um, so knock on wood. Um, thank you. Um, what One of the other earlier questions um, was, do you ever teach and then it was a two-parter um how long did it take you um the the questioner is at, assuming that you're supporting yourself with your writing right now how long um until you were able to support yourself with your writing um i am able to support myself um that's more than my bra says no i <laughs> but um Yes, it took a long time um, no, to, to get published. But then after I got published, even though I didn't get an advance, what I learned was you start seeing money right away then. You don't, you know, if it's sold to, you know, like Germany or paperback rights. Whereas if you have an advance, you don't get any of that money back um, or monies later until you've paid off that advance. Um, so yes, I've been fortunate that I've been able to support myself. Um, what was the earlier part of the question? And then do you ever teach? Oh, do I ever teach? I have taught. Um, I, I, and people have told me they've enjoyed my classes, but I, I feel like I'm, like I should be one of the students, you know, passing notes and you know throwing paper airplanes I just because a part of me thinks can writing really be taught and I I did go to the loft um, our fabulous uh, literary center when I was writing Patty Jane and our assignments I took a class and our assignments were to read 20 pages of another student's work that week and then discuss it the following week. So I did learn, you know, about what people liked, what they didn't like. Um, but I, I, I think I'm a fun teacher, but, you know, somebody might go away um, with Joyce Carol Oates as their teacher, you know, so. <laughs> So we're getting we're getting close to our end times. So um, I want to bring us back sort of to more of the general discussion. You said that what you love about libraries is that you know you're finding books that you weren't even looking for. Yeah. So I love that spirit of exploration. 
but the people today want to know what are you reading right now? What what should we be writing on our list that we should go check out from the library well, or buy to support the authors? My book club is reading Ghetto Side um, mm -hmm. by Jill Lavoy, and that's a nonfiction book uh, uh, set in LA. It's really good, uh, hard to read, but really good. Um, and then you know I I'm not always on my thriller kick, but I I have been reading um, Dean Koontz's books about a female FBI agent um, on the run because she's discovered this uh, conspiracy um, that's trying to alter the minds of people. And it's, I, I think he's a, he's a really fun reader um, and he, he values language. And so I like his metaphors but he's certainly fast paced. And um, I just like to wonder what I would do in that FBI agent's um, position. And I just, I'd probably just go in the bathroom and lock the door because what a life she's got. Um, so yeah, uh, and I, I have a stack of books in my other room that I got from the library. Um, and of course the titles right now, <laughs> just fly through my head. Um, but if I think of them soon, I'll let you know. <laughs> well, thank you for the book title recommendations. Thank you for your comments, as well as answering all this random set of questions. I want to encourage all of our participants today to certainly go out and get a copy of Chronicles of a Radical Hague with recipes. And Remember, this it's not a memoir. It's an <laughs> 